from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. If I could have your attention, we'd like to get back on our schedule. Over time, the time allotted for oral argument before our nation's highest court has shortened. And the significance of this trend is that the shorter the time, the more precious is each minute. So we plan to follow this practice this afternoon. Without further ado, therefore, let me introduce Chuck Verrill, President of the Friends of the Law Library of Congress. Chuck is a partner and head of the International Trade and Policy Practice Group at Wiley Ryan. He practices here in Washington. And he's also an educator, training a new generation of legal scholars at both Georgetown University Law Center and at Duke. Chuck, would you please come to the podium? Thank you, Roberta, <coughs> for your kind introduction. Uh, on behalf of the Friends of the Law Library of Congress, I'd like to welcome our guests to the 15th Annual Wickersham Awards celebration. Before I begin, I'd like to <coughs> recognize those individuals and organizations who are part of our Wickersham and Directors Circle many membership, many of whom are <coughs> joining us here today. These include the Burton Foundation, Sagat Burton LLP, Lexis Nexus, Northwestern University School of Law, <coughs> Roberta, who we've just heard from, Thomson Reuters, and the William S. Hine Company. Thanks to all of our members who are joining us here today for this very special event. The Friends of the Law Library of Congress was established in 1932 by a group of prominent attorneys and jurists led by former U.S. Attorney General George Wickersham. The organization was created to encourage awareness and support of the law library, to contribute to its collections, and to sponsor programs that contribute, promote a better understanding of the law. The Friends seek to stimulate interest in the largest and most comprehensive source of legal information in the world. This year, the Friends of the Law Library established the Blackstone Award to honor an, <coughs> an individual whose significant dedication advances the mission and activities of the Law Library. The award is named for Sir William Blackstone, the 18th century English jurist and politician whose great work, Commentaries on the Laws of England, transformed the study of common law. The inaugural recipient of the Blackstone Award is William C. Burton, a partner at Sagat Burton in New York his practice is devoted to lobbying at the federal and state levels. He has served as <coughs> New York Assistant, New York State Assistant Attorney General and Assistant New York State Special Prosecutor. For 15 years, he was Director of Government Affairs for the Continental Insurance Company. Notably, he is the author of Burton's Legal Thesaurus, a renowned legal reference tool which is now in its fourth edition. The thesaurus recently celebrated its 25th anniversary. In addition, Bill is the founder and chairman of the Burton Awards for Legal Achievement, which honors great accomplishments in the legal profession and, and which is now in its 11th year. Tonight, Bill will be hosting the Burton Awards here in the Library of Congress. Bill's contributions to the Law Library of Congress and to the Friends are stellar. He has served new, <coughs> opened new doors for us and helped us garner a multitude of new friends. For many years, Bill has <coughs> been more than generous with his time and expertise, always willing to make a phone call or to connect us with an interested person. His enthusiasm for the work of the law library is infectious, and the friends relish his deep and sustained commitment to the law library. As an ardent supporter of the law library, <clears throat> Bill understands its unique place in the world's legal firmament and the importance that our collections have in an interconnected global world. Bill's devotion to the law library is that of an amicus certus, a true friend. 
On behalf of the Friends of the Law Library, it is with great pleasure and admiration that I present the Blackstone Award to Bill Burton. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm um, deeply appreciative and proud to be honored by the friends of the Law Library of Congress. I thank all of its members, including Roberta Schaefer, Robert Newland, my good friends, uh, for thinking and making all this happen. To think that I would ever be recognized by the friends of the Law Library of Congress such a venerable institution, which began, as you heard, in 1832. To think that I'd ever feel like I was there at the grand opening. Such a special moment for me. What a rare honor to share this podium and the program with such a giant in the law, Justice Stevens. I have long admired him and his illustrious career, and he is truly an icon. Looking back, I owe whatever success I've been able to garner in large part to the strong support of my family, to their love and encouragement, and even at times, their patience. I am so very fortunate to have them here tonight. When I was told that I was getting the Sir William Blackstone Award, I started to think of what striking similarities there might be between myself and Sir William Blackstone. For one, I found that Blackstone and Burton are both two syllables. <laughs> I also found, after looking at it very closely, that the first name of both of us is William. And lastly, I know he was called Sir and I've been called Surly. One question that raised and possessed me is whatever motivated me to do this, to start an awards program that's really the cornerstone of legal writing. I um, was not motivated in the same way as Alfred Nobel. Um, he woke up one morning to read his obituary. It seems that a French newspaper had mistaken him for his brother Ludwig. He was shocked, and from the profound effect of reading about his demise, he changed his will and created the foundation for the Nobel Prizes. Whoever thought at that time they would be the takeover target for me. But in any event, I wanted to tell you that um, what actually could have killed uh, at that time Alfred Nobel was that was that legal writing was lethal. So I set out to find a cure, and I'm still working on it. As Frederick Robel once said, there are only two things wrong with legal writing. One is style, and the other is content. <laughs> we are making inroads, though. Uh, I want to tell you that um, I feel that we could strike a fatal blow um, if we were to form what I refer to as the Universal Law Reform Pact. The new pact would involve the courts, the Congress, and all counselors of law, and together everyone would agree to require clear, concise, and comprehensible writing in every aspect of law. That means communications, statutes, forms, rules, regulations at every level of government, decisions, and memorandum of law. No more arch ar archaic expressions, turgid and inflated writing, and run-on sentences that rival Jonathan Coe's record-breaking sentence in his novel, which contained in one sentence 14,000 words. That's the record holder. It's no wonder that Truman Capote said, I believe more in scissors than I do in the pen. We took one step closer this year to our goal when the federal law was required 
uh, was enacted and required all executive agencies to uh, use plain language in all their communications. It was a positive step forward, but nowhere near the finish line. To this day, a great need exists for reform. In a survey conducted by professors on a broad cross-section of judges, practicing attorneys and law professors in 2007, 93% of all those questions, including the federal judges, um, were uh, complaining about uh, writing deficiencies and uh, said that the briefs were marred by ineffective writing. 93.8%. I sort of wonder what the 8.8% of a judge might have been. Was that someone waiting for confirmation? But 93% shows the amount of people who are, it, they recognize this great need. As part of the universal uh, law reform pact, I propose that all members of the judiciary continue to comment on briefs that they receive. This was an, is an effective tool to uh, drive home the importance uh, of legal writing and to also single out the noisome and offensive transgressors. And certain examples stand out. When Judge Richard Posner of the Seventh Circuit criticized the writing in the brief because it's difficult to understand, that was helpful. When Judge Posner in another case called the appellate's brief rambling and emphasized it had been, it needed to be compressed, that also supported our efforts. But good writing should also be applauded when effectively, when effectively written. Judge Posner in Indiana Lumberman's case called the briefs well-written and professionally competent. And here's a thought. If the judges were to nominate the briefs for an award, I'm sure my program would include that uh, recognition uh, in, in the um, in, in, in their fabric of the uh, awards program. Other judges have often, ta often taken a leading role in speaking out on legal writing. In a U.S. District Court case in Pennsylvania, Judge William Dicker stated, the complaint is verbose and repetitive. The jury instructions were a mishmash of misdirections, misnomers, and mistakes. And then came the fatal blow Judge Ditter wrote, while the complainant's spelling, grammar, and punctuation are imaginative and novel, its legal theories were not. <laughs> Yet in another case, Smith versus the town of Easton, the Seventh Circuit held the appellant's brief as rambling, almost totally incomprehensible in its treatment of issues and legal principles. There's a responsibility to present issues clearly and comprehensively, the court emphasized. But perhaps the most memorable opinion on legal writing was handed down by federal bankruptcy judge Leif M. Clark in the Western District of Texas in 1996. He denied a motion on the, on the sole grounds that the, the written motion was totally incomprehensible. In his decision, he likened the motion to the oral arguments made by a competition judge played by actor Jim Downey in the movie Billy Madison, who responded to Adam Sandler, Mr. Madison, what you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I've ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response was there anything that could even be considered a rational thought. Everybody in this room is now considerably dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. If judges, through wit or otherwise, continue to shine a spotlight on legal writing, they will greatly contribute to the best ends of legal writing. I hope that one day, particularly through the universal pact I propose today, we will find a cure to this age-old affliction of legalese. When we do, it will be a great day in law and a story with a very happy ending. Thank you. Okay, now, I need a chair. Can I get a chair? Thank you. Can you just give me a chair? Okay, thank you. Okay, if we can just push that. Okay, I'll just sit here. I 
hang out for a moment. Okay, that sounds wonderful. Hang out for as long as you would like. <laughs> Although the law library looks to new technology to enhance our services, we also understand that the law is built on precedent. And this legal precedent has a long and stimulating history. And according to Bill Burton, it's a very verbose history. One of the ways that our collections manifest the development of law is through our rare book collection, which is among the finest in the world, and I'm happy to tell you, is consulted frequently by contemporary legal researchers. Recently, the Library of Congress, the Law Library's collection, was greatly enhanced due to the generosity of Julie Kristen Opperman. She's sitting here right before my eyes. In honor of her husband, Dwight D. Opperman's upcoming birthday at the end of June. I hasten to remind you that Father's Day is coming up. <laughs> the Opperman's gift enabled the Law Library to acquire two volumes of an extraordinarily rare 1498 edition of Causes Brefis of Johannes de Turnout, printed by the Brotherhood of the Common Life at their Brussels Press, De Nazareth Giprint. This gift makes the Law Library of Congress the only location in the United States to house this work from 1498, printed just a few years after the Gutenberg Bible which you may have had the pleasure of passing as you came down the corridor to lunch this afternoon. The Casas Briefus will be on display and is on display in the adjacent room following our program so that our guests may see the magnificence of this work and its incredibly pristine condition. Again, our sincerest gratitude to the Oppermans. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. I also would like to note that uh, Dwight Opperman was the first recipient of the Wickersham Award. So thank you very much, Dwight, for all that you have done in your lifetime for legal research and legal publishing. The Librarian of Congress, James H. Billington, is unable to join us today because he is out of the country on library business. However, he has sent some excellent ambassadors. Please join me in acknowledging Robert Dysart, Jr., Chief of Staff. Deanna, Deanna B. Markham, Associate Librarian for Library Services. And Elizabeth Pugh, our wonderful General Counsel. I would also like to introduce Mark Diminution, who's sitting here behind the pillar, the Chief of our Rare Books and Special Collections Division. After today's ceremony, Mark will be giving a talk about Jefferson's Library, and I have heard this talk, and I hope that whatever you had planned to do this afternoon, you can quickly change your plans and attend. And now I would just briefly like to give the podium over to David Ruder. He is the William Gurley Memorial Professor of Law Emeritus at Northwestern University School of Law. David has had an incredible career he served as Dean of Northwestern, Chairman of the, U of the uh, U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, and just in May of 2010 was appointed, appointed as a member of the joint F CFTC SEC Advisory Committee on Emerging Regulatory Issues. Thank you for joining us today, and please take the podium. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. John Paul Stevens, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States from 1975 to 2010, received his JD magna cum laude from Northwestern University School of Law in 1947. I am honored to be able to carry a message from Northwestern to the man I have known and admired for so many years. In all phases of his career, John Stevens has exemplified the best that any law school could expect from one of its graduates. On behalf of Northwestern's law school and its faculty, I offer the greatest of good wishes to you, John, on the occasion of your receipt of the Wickersham Award by the Friends of the Law Library of Congress. 
By its terms, the Wickersham Award recognizes, recognizes a distinguished individual who has made a significant contribution to the legal profession. This rather dry accolade does not nearly express the boundless admiration all of us at Northwestern have for our graduate. He's a consummate, fair-minded legal scholar known for his intellect, integrity, civility, warmth, and kindness to all who have had contact with him. His Supreme Court opinions have had a major impact on our nation's jurisprudence. As a World War II veteran, Justice Stevens obtained his Northwestern Law degree in two years, graduating under the tutelage of a great faculty. And I'm going to list their names for you, John, so you can hear them. Homer Carey, William Carey, Leon Green, Harold Havoghurst, Fred Inbaugh, Brunson McChesney, Nathaniel Nathanson, Willard Pedrick, James Rawl, Walter Schaefer, Daniel Schuyler, Edward Sweeney, and Willard Wirtz. Justice Stevens has been an extremely loyal Northwestern Law alumnus. In 1984, he spoke at the dedication of the law school's new Rubloff building. In 1992, he served as the third Howard Trenan's visiting scholar, and this year he gave the law school's commencement address, concluding with the advice to our graduating students that your most valuable asset as a member of the legal profession is your integrity. Justice Stevens has also hired many Northwestern law graduates as law clerks. They are unanimous in their praise of his intellectual and personal qualities. On the human side, Larry Marshall, now a law professor at Stanford Law School, calls him fiercely independent, open-minded, deliberative, humane, and graceful. As you may know, Justice Stevens served as a clerk for Associate Justice William Wiley Rutledge in his first year after his 1947 graduation from Northwestern. What you may not know is that the he and Arthur Cedar were in a virtual tie for the best grades in their class. They flipped a coin to decide who would choose between clerking for Justice Rutledge and clerking for Chief Justice Fred Vinson. John won and chose Justice Rutledge because he could start his clerkship in 1947 instead of waiting until 1948. Northwestern's most famous dean, John Henry Wigmore, used to lead the law students in a song beginning, Old Northwestern, that's where we learned our law. Another of our deans often used the phrase, post hoc ergo propter hoc. Translated by some as meaning, after this, therefore, because of this. Some say that this theory of causation is fallacious. But we at Northwestern like to think that in the case of John Paul Stevens, the theory has been proven. Justice Stevens learned his law at Northwestern, won a coin flip allowing him to enter a Supreme Court clerkship on his own schedule, and then became one of the greatest of the members of the United States Supreme Court. John, we offer you our congratulations on the occasion of the receipt of the Wickersham Award and our warmth wishes to you for continued success and happiness. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your kind words. This and, is the award. I'm oh. just going to let you look at it. Wonderful. It's very heavy, so. <laughs> okay. Well, I can hold it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're too kind, but I appreciate everything you've said. The, um, in response, I thought I'd say two or three things. First of all, the uh, chef at the Library of Congress is probably better than the officer in charge of the cafeteria at the Supreme Court. <laughs> and uh, secondly, I wanted to tell you that when I was told that I was going to be eligible for this, for this award, I took a look at the past names of the past recipients to see what kind of company I was joining. 
And I found most of them were old friends. It was a surprise to me to find names like Sandy Dallenberg and, and other old friends on the list. But I was particularly delighted to learn that uh, Dwight Opperman had been the number one recipient of the award. It was a, we go back as friends for a good many years. And I was particularly looking forward to this occasion as that chance to see uh, uh, Dwight again. And I was surprised at the, to learn about the coincidence of the fact that you contributed that very marvelous uh, uh, volume to the library's collection, but that's not the reason I came. I just came because it would be good to see an old, an old friend. Another thing that was of interest to me in, in reading about the background of, of Wickersham and the, and the award is that uh, I'm, I'm working on a book, I should say, about uh, the five chief justices that I've known uh, since the since I won the uh, corn flip, was, uh, Vincent was the first, to, first of the five. But one of the one of the chief justices was, of course, the Earl Warren. And one of his most famous and controversial opinions was in the Miranda case, where he held that police ought to act in a professional manner in interrogating suspects. And it was interesting to me to reading about Wickersham that he was, of course, a very conservative Republican at the time. But he, he wrote a report that commented in some detail about police practices, and his report could well have been the background of Warren's opinion in the Miranda case, of all, of all things. So that it, it sheds a little light on the fact that, that uh, the views of, of uh, conservative Republicans are somewhat different today than they were in the days of uh, Mr. Wick Wickersham. So I thank you very much. It's, a, it's an honor and a, a privilege to receive this award, and, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I would like to welcome journalist Gwen Eiffel, who will be interviewing Justice Stevens. I think she, like Justice Stevens, is a well-known name to this audience. She is the moderator and managing editor of Washington Week and senior correspondent for the PBS NewsHour. And I don't think that uh, I'm going to hold up this momentous occasion anyway, and I'm going to just turn the floor over to uh, Ms. Eiffel. Thank, Thank you, you Sarah. Sarah. And just wave at me when you want me to stop, because we could talk all day. <laughs> we already, we've already uh, solved the problem of the Cubs and the issue. <laughs> that the Cubs can't quite determine. So we decided to set that aside for this conversation. Well. But we do want to start by telling, starting, start with what everybody in this room knows, which is you are the second longest serving justice ever. You are coming right up on Justice Douglas. What was the secret to your survival? What is the key to my survival? <clears throat> well, I think the, the most important uh, key to my survival, is, and that's the advice I give to everybody in the room, is you should marry a beautiful dietitian. <laughs> <laughs> and that will achieve wonders for you. No, really, legally. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> well, tell me, well, okay, let's go back. I want to talk to you about your book, because you alluded to the fact that you're writing a book, and you have a wealth of experience having worked with or alongside five different chief justices, and in including the current one. Were you nervous a little bit or hesitant to write a book? A tell-all, which I'm sure it is. No, to tell you the truth, <coughs> it's sort of just uh, uh, happened. Uh, I've, since I retired, I've participated in a number of, of events where people ask questions back and forth, and I answer them. They're, they're, they're desirable forms of attending meetings, so you don't have to do an awful lot of preparation as you do. If you, and I never, I never followed the practice of having set speeches that I give over and over again to the same, uh, to different groups. But in those occasions, I was surprised how often people asked me to compare the different chief justices that I'd served with. And it occurred to me, and, and I've always had difficulty making a coherent answer to the question, but it occurred to me that it might be of interest to write a book about the subject. And so I decided to, to start with uh, Vincent and then Warren and then the three that I served with uh, on the court. How, how did the court change in, in your 34, 35 years there? Let's see now, you have probably four or five hours to listen to <laughs> A lot. <laughs> well, of course, the change is, it's changed 
uh, <coughs> Byron Wright White used to say that every time the new justice joins the court, it's a different court because you have different dynamics within the court. You're, you're, you just work with a different, different group of people. And the new justice always has an impact on the way the court processes its cases and decides them. So I've, I've uh, served through a series of changes and each one has made a significant difference. So I'm not sure I could summarize the, the well, entire. Well, you were well known, it's been written everywhere that you, that you changed. Well, people say, I'm just telling you what people say. People say that you changed over your years of the court, that you were nominated by, you were the last Reagan nominee, and that over your, Nixon. Ford. 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 Fourth. Yeah. Fourth, thank you. And that, but that in the end, but that by the time you left, you were considered to be the liberal line of the court. Did the court change or did you? Well, <clears throat> there's probably some of, some of each, but I really, uh, and I've thought about this from time to time uh, since I retired, I can, I've only been able to identify uh, one case uh, that I voted on in my years on the court, but I think I would vote differently today than I did at the time I made the decision. Which is? The, the case is the, is the Texas death penalty case. It is one of, one of the five that we passed on in my first year on the court. I think we should have held that, that particular statute unconstitutional because the instruction that it requires the judge to give to the jury, I think, in effect, made the statute a, a mandatory death penalty statute. And I think I, I should have recognized that at the time. But with, with that exception, I, I really am not aware of any cases that I, I would have decided differently, which made, leads me to believe that the change in the personnel of the court is, is more, has been more important than a change in my own views. People cite the death penalty as being the, the, the issue that you changed most dramatically on. Do you not see it that way? No, I think what happened primarily, and I've, I've uh, written this out in a, in a review in the New York Review of Books a couple of months ago. I think the main thing that happened since the 1975 term is that the court adopted a series of decisions that in effect changed the, the rules that we thought were in place at the time of those decisions and made it much easier for prosecutors to obtain the death penalty, expanded the universe of cases in which the death penalty is available and they changed a number of procedural rules that gave the prosecution a significant advantage in capital cases that the prosecution does not have in ordinary cases. One of, the, one of those changes involves the method of jury selection in which the, the questions that are permitted now uh, allow the prosecutor to get a much more prosecution-prone jury than they can in, in, in other cases. And they also have allowed in death penalty jurisprudence what they call victim impact evidence, which they allow the prosecutor to introduce uh, a great deal of evidence of an emotional character that tends to distort the, uh, the deliberative process. And there have been other changes too, but I think that, that what has changed in the period since 1976 is that the court's uh, uh, death penalty jurisprudence, I think, has moved in a direction that I think has really undermines the integrity of the entire process. Another issue that people cite as, as evidence of your evolution is affirmative action. That in one, case, one instance you ruled against upholding a law that involved affirmative action in contracting, and later on when it came to the University of Michigan case, you voted to support the notion of affirmative action in law, in, law, in this case, law school admission. What was the distinction for you? Well, there, <coughs> there are several distinctions. Well, one very obvious dis distinction is there's a big difference between whether or not, uh, let, me, let me back up a little bit. Early on in the year, my years on the court, the principal approach to affirmative action by the court was to decide whether it was an appropriate remedy for past wrongdoing. Right. And in a case that was decided, I don't know when, it came out of Jackson, Michigan, I wrote a separate opinion. I was all alone in the case. I said, that's not the right approach. You should look at what benefits can be obtained by reason of, of affirmative action programs rather than looking at whether or not they're an appropriate remedy for past wrongdoing, because I don't think you'd ever get an appropriate remedy for the t uh, terrible wrongs that uh, were committed against uh, 
uh, African Americans over the years. But the, the big difference in the, in the uh, Michigan case was that the focus on that case was the benefits to be obtained by a diverse stu student body. And actually one of the very important briefs filed in that case was filed on behalf of uh, the military community, uh, generals and admirals and so forth, who, who made a very persuasive argument that the uh, officer corps in the American military had been greatly improved by using an affirmative action technique in selecting uh, people to become, to, to train for, for, uh, for officers, both the Navy and the Army and the Air Force. And the difference was that they were, then, they were looking at what can be gained for the future out of a diverse program as opposed to what are we making an appropriate remedy for what happened in the past. And I think that that change in, uh, in uh, emphasis had a big impact on, on that particular case. I think that really explains why they upheld the, the uh, Michigan program. The distinction between making reparations for something that you can't change and trying to do something to fix what comes next. That's correct. That's correct. Let me ask you about Citizens United. You wrote a famous 90-page blistering dissent, which you read from the bench. Right. How long did that take? How long to, to write it or to read it? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it won't take, maybe they would take just as long. Well, uh, and what's the question? Well, the question is, he caught me on that. The question was, you wrote in that dissent that you thought this was sending the court in the wrong path and that this was a betrayal of what the court should be doing. You were very specific about that. Right. Do you st still believe that to be the case, seeing what's happened since, that they set the court in the wrong direction? Well, uh, very briefly, I haven't changed my, <laughs> my views in the year, year or two since it's been decided. No, I, feel, I feel that the, I stand by what I, what I said in that. Uh, well, so how that. much damage has been done? Well, I'm not uh, uh, an expert in evaluating a post-decision damage. I, 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 I'm not an expert in, in the, the political consequences, of, but I do think the decision was quite wrong, and I think it's uh, uh, quite wrong to assume that uh, money is exactly the same as speech itself. There's a vast difference between rules that dictate what persons may say in a political argument and rules that dis determine how much money can be spent in, uh, in uh, uh, debating issues. I mean, it just it seems to me in the, just the one very elementary example is in the Supreme Court itself. Each side is given an equal amount of time in order to present their arguments, and it's fair to both sides to do it. But if you, if you analogize that to political debates, it seems to me there's nothing fundamentally wrong with saying that each side should be able to have roughly the same amount of assets and ability to, to uh, present their points of view. Because so they're uh, basically, it's a, it's a debate that you're, you're uh, tr uh, trying to produce answers in. It must be very difficult for you not to, uh, to succumb to the desire that people like me have to make you talk about the political implications of court decisions. So when I ask you about Bush against Gore, that's not what I mean, really. <laughs> but I wonder, when, when you talk about long-term impacts, long-term effects to the court, and the process of the court itself, not necessarily the politics of the nation, what, what role do you think that Bush against Gore played in changing the vibe of the court, the way the court functions, how the court decides? Well, the only thing I'd say about uh, Bush against Gore is that uh, I don't think the court has cited it since the decision came down. So maybe it's not all that important. <laughs> oh, so you think that was an anomaly? Pardon me? It was an anomaly? Well, it the was court an perhaps wasn't that proud of? It was an unusual case. <laughs> okay, I'll let, you, I'll let you get away with that for now. Um, you know, you... Um, Sir, you talked about how the court changes with every new member. One of the new members who came on while you were there was Justice Ginsburg, who had actually argued before you yes. at some point. Did that change at all? Did that alter your relationship when she, once she arrived? Oh, uh, no. I, I mean, I was delighted to have her arrive because she's a, a great lawyer and a great person and a great friend. Uh, but, uh, uh, of course, our relationship was not the same as when she was an advocate. 
Uh, I think I probably voted with her most of the time during her argument. She, she, she presented a good argument. She's a wonderful scholar and a good, uh, a good judge and a, a good friend. I'm always curious about how justices get along, really. I know there's a famous handshake before you go out, but how collegial is it? It's true. It might be interesting to you to know that <clears throat> there's an interesting book that came out during the last year called The Scorpions about <clears throat> principally talking about the court during the general period when I was a law clerk, in which the, there's a lot of inferences and speculation about the, the personal relationships among the justices that were not cordial. At least that was the impression. And I must say that I had the impression when I was a law clerk that some of, there were some personal uh, differences that may have affected the justices' relations with one another. And I remember some years later, when Thurgood Marshall came to the Seventh Circuit to address the, the, the uh, Seventh Circuit Bar, because I was, as a Chicago lawyer, a member of that bar, and he was asked a question about the personal relationships among the judges. He said, well, we're all friends. We get along perfectly well, uh, other than disagreeing on the merits of cases. And I remember thinking to myself, well, that's the, that's the, that's the line that they're, they're, they're putting forward. And I was curious when I, when I joined the court in 1975 to find out whether that was really true. And of course, I should have realized that Thurgood is a totally honest guy and he would not paper over anything that wasn't true. But I found that was true. And as a, on a personal basis, the justices get along with each other beautifully. They are, they are in fact good friends. And I still feel that every member of the court that's there now, I consider a friend. But the differences are on the, on the merits of the various issues that we have to confront. And we do feel very strongly about, about some of those. But they do not affect the, uh, the personal relationships among the judges. In fact, that's one of the great things about that institution is that they really are able to work together in a cordial and honest way without having been distracted by personal animosity or anything like that. So you're saying the thing you missed the most was engaging with Justice Scalia? Well, I enjoyed, I mean, we, we, we enjoyed uh, uh, disagreeing with one another. He's, yeah. uh, he's, uh, I, I really was very flattered, I think, in the, in the uh, Chicago case involving whether or not uh, the Second Amendment is applicable to the states, it's a decision that uh, the Second Amendment, which is, of course, intended to protect the right of state militias to run their own shows with regard to guns. That case they held, well, the federal judges are going to make the decision, not the state legislatures. But in that case, I wrote a rather long dissent, and I was quite flattered by the fact that he thought it necessary to write a reply. <laughs> so <laughs> he wrote about 15 pages to telling everybody how stupid I was. Well, in, in a way, I thought that was really kind of a compliment because if he really thought I was that stupid, he didn't have to tell anybody. <laughs> but no, he's a, he's a very fine man and a, and a, a, a delightful person. He's probably one of the best senses of humor you'll ever, you'll ever come across. In your retirement, I assume you're still playing tennis? I am, but I have to confess, and I went to a doctor today, said I've got a bum knee that, uh, oh. that is uh, impairing my ability to cover the court the, the way I want to, but I've solved it in a way that, that's very, very unique. I have a very good friend as my opponent, and one of our unwritten rules is he hits it to me. He, he <laughs> <laughs> I can make him run, but he, he, he tries to keep prolong the points by hitting it to me. Maybe that's the way to work you out your whole life, to make sure someone hits it to you. That's the way you succeed. Yeah. So I, I have um, one final question for you, because as once again, we all are enjoying this, but I really do want to get you wisdom on this, because in the amount of time you were on the court, the number of justices you worked with, the number of attorneys who argued before you, the number of times you struggled to come up with a consistent worldview, what did you take away from that that you can now advise people who want to be lawyers today? People who say, I want to do this for a living for the reasons, and they look at you and say, I can do that. What do you tell them? Well, of course, I haven't really been asked that question uh, too often to say I've got a standard answer. But it's, it's, it's nothing very, very profound. You do your best. You try to 
answer the question as honestly as you can. And you, you, you must, of course, if, if <clears throat> you're talking about judicial work, you have to remember you're not the person who decides the poly, policy questions. You, are, you must defer to other decision makers over and over and over again and, and not to try to answer the questions yourself. And uh, uh, of course, you, the, as, as somebody quoted, I guess David quoted in the introduction, uh, the really the most important uh, asset a lawyer has is his own integrity and be, and be recognized for being honest about what he really believes should be done and, and be uh, faithful to his own uh, uh, views about the law. Even if ultimately it's not in agree agreement with everyone around you, as long as you know what you believe. Absolutely. There have been many, many cases in which I thought I had to vote in a particular way on an issue, even though I thought that the, uh, the decision <coughs> was not in the best interest of the community. And uh, actually, I can quote Thurgood Marshall on this. I can remember him more than once saying this, nothing in the Constitution that prevents Congress from enacting stupid laws. <laughs> <laughs> it's not up to you to fix it, necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> Justice John Paul Stevens, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just wanted to, before we all go back to our busy lives, make a connection for you between the Supreme Court and the Library of Congress. And it's not just a geographic connection. It's not just that we are across the street from each other. But uh, oftentimes, the Supreme Court will call upon the expertise in the law library, our foreign law, our non-US law expertise. And every once in a while, we will garner a footnote in a Supreme Court decision, which makes us all very, very happy. Second, the court relies upon the Library of Congress collections to supplement its materials. And every day, messengers go back and forth between our two libraries, the Supreme Court's library and the Library of Congress, bringing materials on any manner of subjects. So not just legal materials, but all kinds of other information that the court uses to craft their decisions. And we are very, very delighted by that. 46 justices of the court have given their papers to the Library of Congress's manuscript division. And we continue to welcome those contributions uh, for sitting members on the court and those who will be appointed in generations to come. But last but not least, and I think the most important thing for us at the Library of Congress is that we guarantee to the justices of the Supreme Court of the United States and justices from courts all over the world that your decisions, that your knowledge will be kept here and will be here as a resource for generations to come as they look to your wisdom to inform and solve the challenges that they will face in their time. And so we promise you that. I thank all of you for being with us today. It's been absolutely a thrill to honor Justice Stevens, Bill Burton, and we thank Ms. Eiffel for her wonderful interview, and of course, Julie Opperman for finding the perfect gift for Dwight's birthday. You have given a present to Dwight and to America. Thank you all for being here, and have a wonderful rest of the day. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.